Okay, so I think we are ready to start. So again, welcome everyone. My name is Mariangela Pellegrini. I'm the Educational and Patient Program Manager for the ORN Eurobonet. So I'm very happy to uh, indeed welcome all of you, not only from the ORN Eurobonet side, but also from Genomet for All Steering Committee. Uh, to this um, online educational program on artificial intelligence in hematology targeting public at large. So indeed, this program has been conceived by the Genomet for All Educational and Scientific Committee. As you can see, it is a, an interactive online webinar. And um, we aim indeed with this program to increase and spread the awareness on this growing role of artificial intelligence for medicine, so for diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up on the um, three different clinical domains of hematology. So as you may know, this program consists of four webinars. Uh, each webinar is provided by key expert in the field, so in the application of artificial intelligence on rare hematological disease. The program has started on the 13th of September, and we had already two lectures. So the first one was on Genomet for All, a DRN Eurobronet for Precision Medicine and Hematology. Then uh, on the 27th, we presented the use case challenging on MDS, sickle cell disease, and multiple myeloma. And today we are going to talk about data standardization and linkage, so standards and federation. But before arriving to today's lecture and introducing you to speakers, I would like to share with you some home rules. So first of all, as you can see, this session is recorded because the webinar, the videos of the webinar will be implemented in our e-learning environment, both from Genomet for All and uh, ERA Neuroblonet sites. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can switch off your camera, change your name, or just notify to it and we'll take care uh, during the edition. Um, secondly, uh, your microphone are muted and they will be muted along all the presentation. Uh, but as you can see, um, there is a Q code uh, displayed and also website displayed, website link displayed on the screen. It's a Slido, it's a polling tool uh, for gathering question. Uh, so please use it for uh, collecting your comment, feedback or question during the webinar. All those aspects will be tackled at the end of the presentation. So we will take care of each comment and question you may write. Um, also, of course, at the end of the presentation, if you wish to unmute yourself and take the floor, also this is very welcome. Said so, we can finally arrive at today's lecture. So we, as said, we will talk about data standardization and linkage, so standard and federation. Uh, with us today, three key speakers had said, so Silvia Uribe Mayoral, Vincent Planant, and David Picha. For introducing them very quickly, so Silvia Uribe Mayoral, she's a telecom engineer and she has also a master's degree in communication technology and system. Since 2021, she works as assistant professor at the Escuela Tecnica Superior de Ingeniería at la Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Uh, Vincent Plana is a graduate in Lyon in, and in Stellar Imagining. And after his initial career in telecommunication, um, he works now as a technologist expert in the Central Global Consulting and Solution Teams. Um, and finally, uh, David Picha, he has a um, PhD in Thermal Engineer and he leads the Data Platform and Tools Development Team at the CNAH. AAG, uh, when he coordinates the work of a team of 13 software developers and engineer. So um, please, the floor is yours. So I, I, I think Silvia go first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, we would like to say to say thank you to the organizers uh, for being part of this program. Um, well, in this session, we will go into an important issue that affects uh, our field of work, uh, study and research, the disparity and scarcity of the data in rare diseases. 
For doing so, the presentation will be composed by four main topics, as you can see in the in the agenda, with the aim of setting the stage uh, for a discussion on, on how we can bridge the data gap between, uh, for, sorry, in rare diseases, turning the into turning this into a challenge, uh, turning this challenge into an opportunity to transform uh, the healthcare in this area. So our agenda today is divided into several key uh, segments or parts. Uh, in, in the introduction part, we will go from the initial problem statement to the opportunities that we, ha we have in here. Then we, following the introduction, we will deep into the Genomet for All approach from three different perspectives. The first one is related to the fact that one of the main challenges in, in addressing data disparities is the lack of standardized data. In this part, we will explore the challenges of uh, data harmonization and the need of defining a common data model that will bring us consistency for our data. After this, we will discuss the design and development of our platform that uh, we will en enable collaborative analysis without compromising data privacy. And finally, we will under we will uh, go to present uh, how we can use this platform. Uh, finally, once we have presented the Genomet for All uh, platform approach, we will go for the conclusion and lesson learned uh, where we will summarize the key takeaways and lessons learned from the almost two years that we uh, have from the project. And finally, we will be open for, for all of your questions. So before we go into the details, let's remember that our goal today is not merely to identify the challenges about the scarcity and disparity of rare disease data, but also to highlight the different opportunities that this situation can bring us. In this regard, in this in this um, in this uh, environment, data collection and analysis play a crucial role in improving medical data, and we need to have this uh, in mind. So, uh, as you already know, in the hematological area, a, ma a majority sorry a majority of diseases have a genetic basis. In this uh, domain, we find ourselves facing a complex landscape uh, of up, up to uh, 450 gen generic variants, including both oncological and non-oncological conditions that represent an impro important growing public health challenge. So in our attempt to convey these diseases in, a, in the most uh, uh, optimal way, Precision medicine has emerged as an innovative uh, option. However, this option presents some problems that we need to be aware of. In this regard, the application of precision medicine in the hematological area is affected by several critical challenges, where the most important one can be the lack of a well-established international data set to be used uh, for research, diagnosis, and also for treatment. So in the world of rare diseases, such as the one considered in Genomet for All, specific situations have to be taken into account. The first one is that the data is often scarce and fragmented across multiple, multiple surfaces. Uh, adding to this complexity is the fact that the rare disease research involves multiple uh, data modalities. We must consider not only only clinical, but also genomic, demographic, imaging, and other types of data. These different streams of, or information are essential for gaining a holistic understanding of the, of the diseases and defining the different uh, solution for each of them. And finally, there are different approaches to the data standardization. Concepts like OMO, FIRE and phenopackets bring their strengths, but also their complexity to the table. So where to go from here? How we can benefit from the potential of precision medicine in the hematological area with these essential uh, pieces of the 
puzzles are missing. In this challenging landscape, clinical networks play an essential work, uh, sorry, role. Uh, network network uh, uh, such as Euroblotnet, uh, which can pro present a main proof of the power of collaboration. But however, from the technical point of view, we can think also uh, not uh, about an optimal solution, which is the pooling and integration of multiple uh, data sets from different centers. But this option faces a significant resistance in the healthcare context. So it's important to be aware of the main reasons behind the this resistance uh, in order to 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 consider all of them. So uh, we can categorize them into four main areas. We we have reason from the economical and motivational uh, part. We have also reason regarding the legal and ethics. We have different uh, reasons that uh, avoid this sharing data uh, from the technical point of view. And we also have some reason from the political uh, point of view. In a world where, where the data is often considered as a important commodity, Maybe there are some economic uh, economic interests that can sometimes avoid the, this data sharing. So we need to to have this in mind. Data sharing is also related with the legal and ethical with legal and ethical uh, problems, uh, concerns about the privacy of the data, the intellectual property rights, the potential misuse of the data often lead to the to this kind of resistance. There, there are also technical barriers that can also stop this data to be shared. And finally, the political landscape can play a significant role in sharing or not sharing the data within this environment. So in this in mind, what is the innovative approach that offers a solution to these challenges. Uh, we have found uh, a very important one, which is called federated learning. Federated learning allows us to train AI models across distributed data uh, sources without having a central node with all of the data. So this means that instead of bringing the data to the model, we bring the model to the data. So we can allow the preservation and the security of this of, of this sensitive data uh, info, health information. So, in conclusion, to solve this challenge uh, about the promotion of the potential within federated health data repositories, we must think outside the box. Federated learning represents an scalable and privacy-preserving approach that empowers us to train the AI models into a, collab a collaborative way. While this uh, uh, privacy of sensitive data is, in, is assured, so for this reason, federated learning can be considered as the basis of our approach in Genomet for All, which is going to be uh, presented next. Thanks very much, uh, Sylvia, for this introduction and the, the positioning of the different uh, problems that uh, we uh, we we had to to work on on this uh, very uh, interesting project. So, data standardization is a is a, a long story <laughs> along the, the 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 evolutions of the technology in the healthcare IT domain, uh, because from the beginning of this um, of this. Uh, business domain, I would say, the 20 or 30 years ago, we, uh, we already faced the problem of uh, data heterogeneity and disparities. So could we go to the next slide, please? Why? So we need, we 
intuitively we need harmonizing data uh, <clears throat> into a, a project like uh, the one we're working on with Fed based on federated learning. It's intuitive because uh, as we <clears throat> I shown and uh, I come back on this federated learning concept that has been presented by Sylvia. Uh, federated, federated learning concept means that, as she said, uh, we bring models to the data, uh, which means that uh, we, we must uh, distribute uh, models versions to the different contributor of, of a network and we ask this contributor to uh, train their own version of the model and prop propagate back to a central server uh, an updated version of their own train model training. So that means this model exchange means behind the scene that uh, there's a lot of problem around data which are feeding the algorithm because as we all know there is no ai if we don't have data which is at the the source of the of the the model training so training uh, models mean having data and we we have obviously identified from the beginning that there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity of data across the different contributors of this project. So we had to uh, face this uh, consistency and harmonization in order to uh, to address the AI model training and distribution um, pushed by the federated learning uh, concept. The second reason why uh, data harmonization is key for this project is because of the scope of the data type which are uh, which are addressed uh, for for training the model uh, as it has been said at the introduction of this um, of this webinar we are focusing on rare uh, hematological disease and uh, the scope of data that are captured and used for treating and developing a decision support or predictive model around this disease is wide. We have uh, imaging, uh, images uh, that are capturing uh, the cells details, the size of the, 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 the cells that, that are analyzed by the, the searchers. So we, we have image data and we have feature extracted from these images that can be used. We have also, and that is very important in this project, we have access to the clinical history of the patients. So clinical data, which are referring to uh, the studies, the tests, the questionnaires, the observation, the treatment, the diagnostic, all, uh, all information surrounding finally the pure uh, disease itself captured by the image. And that may serve uh, the model development and the, the precision of the, 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 final, uh, the final result. We also, and this is a, a key challenge in this project, we're also tackling genomic data, which are very important for rare disease. And in this space, uh, there's a range of uh, data type <coughs> and data representation that we have to tackle. So three dimension of data may need to, uh, to address, which increase uh, the need for um, harmonizing all of this information. The third reason why we need harmonization is because the systems, the health information systems, which are storing currently this information into the different hospitals, are very often coming, um, always coming from multiple vendors. And the, the vendor space of IF information system is very fragmented and very proprietary. So each vendor has its own way of formatting the data. And this way is not the same as the other or the competitor, obviously. And so when we when we try to aggregate all those, of this data in order to train a model, we are facing a, a lot of heterogeneity between these different sources of uh, record uh, and uh, HIS, uh, HIS sorry, systems. So that, that's the main three reasons why uh, harmonizing, harmonizing the data is key and uh, we had to, uh, to, to address this problem. Could we go to the next slide, please? So, Harmonizing data, what does it mean? In fact, it means agreeing or defining or deciding uh, on a common data model. So what is a common data model? A common data model is, um, is a way to, uh, to represent, I would say, concept into the healthcare domain in a wide manner. So 
Um, when I say concept, it may be how do I represent a diagnostic? Uh, how do I represent a medications? Uh, how I describe um, uh, an observations? Uh, how do I describe a procedures? Uh, and so on. So this how to describe is, um, is, is something that has been um, uh, analyzed and, and addressed by the research community for decades. And uh, we, uh, we thought that uh, in this project, uh, um, we need uh, to define and decide on a common data model. And again, for three, three reasons. Uh, because uh, with federated learning, we need to train a model at the beginning. We have to create a seed, uh, first version of the model, which is propagated and trained by everybody. And to develop this model, we need uh, a reference of data sets to, to submit to the model. And this reference of data set has to be as large and as representative as possible because it's going to be trained on the different edge system. That's why we thought we need even for starting the first model development, we need a common data model reference. So that's the first reason. Um, the second reason um, is that uh, the, as, as we understood, the AI Federation is engaging multiple care, care providers and hospitals in the, in the training process. And for these hospitals to be able to train their own instance of the model, they need also to extract the data from their health information system, from their packs, from their genomic data bank. And uh, each of them has to do it in any case for training the same model in some way. And if uh, we propose a common data model, which is the same as the one that is chosen into the central server for training the seed, so the initial version of the model, then we facilitate a lot the extraction of the data because everybody is speaking finally the same language. So um, if the data science or the data engineer into the hospitals has questions about specific information, he can use this common data model uh, definitions to query the data scientist or understand clearly which data is expected for this model. So that's the second reason why we need a common data model. The third one, which is more subtle and perhaps more not so easy to understand, but uh, uh, for training a model, you need to extract the data from your data set. And um, uh, the, we propose with this project to, uh, to, uh, to define the, what we call the extract transform loan process, which is the process for extracting this information. And by using a common data model, we can benefit, we can provide to all the hospital the same ETL because they are using the common data model behind and they can, so they can, they don't have to invest on extra effort to extract this data for the model. We can provide them attached to the model an, an extraction tools, which facilitate a lot the, and speed up the data extractions uh, from the source of record. So these are the three reasons why after harmonization, we need to choose a common data model. And then the third question we had is, was which data model to choose. And then again, a complex, uh, a complex question that we, uh, we, we, we had to work on with Sylvia, Davide, and everybody in the, in the consortium engaged on this work package is, uh, is again, a disparity of data models. Uh, coming from the community of research. So when we look at genomic, I would say the 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 the, 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 the picture is very in some way very clear because the the genomic pipeline processing world is well structured and well known by everybody, which are mainly applying the same macro step. So for each of these steps, you have a format of data. You have FASTQ, you have BAM, you have SAM, you have, you have a VCF. So all of that is well structured, but already fragmented, but well identified. When we look at the clinical data and try to find a common data model, which could embrace uh, both the clinical data, both the imaging data feature, and also some part of the genomic data, then the situation becomes more complex. And we have uh, identified three outsiders in this uh, selection, which, one which was 
OMOP, uh, another one which was FIRE, and the last one was Phenopacket. So we conducted a very deep analysis based on the use case we have, the feature that we must extract in order to identify what is the best standard we should choose. Uh, at the end, the selection has been, so on the right hand side, you have a, a diagram, which is um, uh, the, the bottom right diagram, which is extracted from a paper that we have published, a journal that we have published, which uh, illustrates all of these ex analyses and uh, uh, detailed uh, chose selection criteria uh, process. Uh, and uh, it presents uh, the, the, the capability of this model in regards to the different usage of the data uh, from the raw data to the, to the, to the up part of the, the usage of the data. So at the end, we have chosen FIRE uh, as a common data model. FIRE is very well known as an interoperability uh, model, data exchange models. It, is, it has also its own common data model. And uh, we have uh, partially chosen this uh, common data model for this uh, double competency because we anticipate with this project uh, future data exchange and with other European projects, and FIRE was also a very good candidate for addressing these needs. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, a last look very quickly at uh, this uh, data extraction from source of record problems that I've mentioned in the previous slide. Here, which shows roughly uh, what are the different uh, 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 what are the different modality of data integration that we had to uh, take into account in order to feed our common data model into the hospitals. So at the bottom, you have imaging and genomic data that are uh, extracted from the packs of or, or the genomic data bank and which are going through a feature extraction data computing uh, activity with guidelines provided by Genomet for all, of course, in order to extract the feature that we are looking for. And these features are uh, populating Excel files that are then used for feeding the local data model. On the clinical data, uh, we have essentially mostly the EHR, so the Health Information System as a source of information. And uh, what is done is that uh, we, are, uh, we are following the standard research pro pro process where you have a clinician which has the ability and which is, who is granted to access patient identifiable data and who has the knowledge of the data accessing the health information system, the EHR, and populating various systems, depending on our partners. It may be a red cap, it may be an EDC directly when the, 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 the care institution has a real uh, a clinical trial management system. It could be also a RADIP a data platform, the case of, of a robot net, for example, that produce Excel files. And again, we have a transformation process, which uh, you take these different information and transform them to be uh, harmonized into the common data model in FIRE uh, that is used for the project. The floor is to you, uh, David. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you also, Sylvia. So I, I'm going to try to explain uh, how we, we build the federated learning platform, what was the rationale, what, what was the, the path that we followed. So the, the, one of the first concepts that I would like to to spread that uh, well, it's a quite complex uh, project endeavor uh, because of different factors. Uh, one factor is that, uh, as you may imagine, the, the, the platform is a distributed system. So there are different uh, actors which are uh, living outside you know, in different places. So we need to take into account this. Also, is an asynchronous uh, platform because uh, uh, basically, when we want to to run a training, so we, we need to get a hold of uh, some computing resources which might not be available. So we have put together like a, bu a buffer uh, module, which uh, basically is a queue. So when you want to train a, a model, then you, you create a job in which you go to a queue, and then when, once once the resources are available, then the training is started. Also, it's complex because uh, but it's a research project, so we are trying to do something which has not been done 
uh, a lot in the, in the past. So there are no nature architecture that we can uh, have a look at it or be inspired. So we, we had to, you know, uh, discover new things, try to uh, innovate a bit. Uh, another, another complexity, as you can, you, you might imagine that uh, the requirements that we, we need to build a platform were not uh, uh, completely fixed at the beginning because uh, some requirements are uh, aware of the output of uh, work packages. So uh, we, we, need, we needed to synchronize with other work packages, uh, try to you know, communicate with them what they need, uh, what we need to know. So that was also a, a, a bit complex. And then of course, uh, because we, we handle uh, sensitive data, genomics, medical, clinical data. So the, 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 pl the platform has to be very secure. So this is also an aspect that we, we need to take uh, into account when we, when we plan and then when we implement the platform. Uh, we, one of the two main objectives that we, we had in mind when we uh, started building the platform that was that uh, the platform needs to be flexible because uh, because this uh, different requirements requirement that we get and also because it, in the future we, we might need to serve uh, different uh, use cases that we are uh, targeting now. So the platform can be very rigid, but it, it, has, it has to be uh, flexible. And also another important point that uh, uh, well, this is a platform that we have been building uh, within a European project, but we, of course, we would like that this platform is going to be used also uh, when the project is over in other, uh, at least uh, uh, research projects. So it's uh, something that we would like to be uh, easy or possible to be sustained in the future. Uh, so because of this, we, we have chosen uh, different modules, but uh, all the modules are open source software. So uh, it means that uh, we are not uh, uh, locked in by some vendor. We are not uh, buying licenses from a commercial uh, provider. So uh, we, think, we think that is a good way to move forward. Also, we try not to reinvent uh, modules or part of functionality that has been already developed outside in the in, in the community, because uh, we, we we are not uh, 100 uh, software engineers, so uh, we are limited resources, and we try to uh, to take a maximum profit of what 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 is already outside, and and also no, because of this we need to be to build something which is very modular, so there are different pieces that can be plugged in. And eventually replace if we see that a module is not working uh, as we expect. Thank you, Silvia. Hey, thank you. So, uh, as the, the the core part is the federated learning, so which is the process where uh, a central hub uh, move um, model weights uh, into the different nodes, and then uh, gather also the result of this uh, training and then do some aggregation and then move it, uh, the, the, the model weights again to the different uh, nodes. So all this uh, is quite complex from a communication, a communicational point of view. Uh, and the, so we, we had to look for a, a, lab, a library which takes care of this. Uh, so at the end, we chose uh, an open source, open source model uh, library, which is called Flower. Uh, but during this process, we have uh, extensively reviewed also uh, different options. So we had defined a set of criteria and we have evaluated the different options at the end based on the result of the of all the criteria we have chosen flower, flower which uh, is indeed uh, open source. It's, it comes from the also from a research environment, but this also has a, a commercial support if needed. And it's very a small library, so it does only one thing, but very well. So a very low level library. And then it's very flexible in the sense that uh, we can use different uh, Python model libraries. So there are, you know, you know, there are TensorFlow, PyTorch, JAX, and all these are uh, uh, compatible with uh, with Flower. And also it's very performant because it, it use very um, good low level communication uh, protocols like a gRPC and, and protobuffer. So this is a, the diagram that we try to explain 
uh, visually what I, I have been trying to explain, uh, you know, with text. So basically, you can see uh, that there are three nodes, uh, which are called lo a local age in this case. And uh, you, you can imagine this like being mainly hospitals, so a department within the hospitals. And then you see there is, there is a central server where uh, uh, everything starts. So the central server communicates to the different nodes, uh, sending uh, uh, the, the model ways, then you know the, the each uh, hospital, each local age has its own data set, which uh, share the same common data model as uh, Vincent explained. But you know the content of the data set is different. So the same model is trained on different uh, data set, and then uh, all the results are gathered together. On the central server, there is some stuff occurring, so aggregation, checking, quality, and then it's sent it back again to the to the hospitals. A apart from the flower, which is the federated learning uh, library, so we needed to to choose different modules, as I mentioned before. So we try to you know, put together like different bricks, and one important piece is the the server. So the server is the uh, the module, the software that allows uh, to communicate between different nodes. So we need to organize uh, quite a lot of communication between the central server and the different nodes. Uh, so we need uh, you know standard communication, and for this uh, we are using Fast API. Which is an open source uh, Python based web framework, uh, which is very popular, especially in the, in the machine learning community. And it's uh, provided also some uh, good uh, feature, like uh, you automatically document very well the APIs that uh, you know the, the system has to use. And then uh, we had to also create some user interface. So, because uh, we you know, we want to do something also user friendly, which has to be responsive, which has to be, you know, uh, uh, have a, a nice aspect. So we, we, bueno, as a framework, we use uh, the view, which is also an open source, very popular uh, web framework. And then another important aspect is how we manage the life cycle of a machine learning or AI model. So again, it's a complex task. task which requires a lot of uh, uh, steps. And on this part, we rely on uh, another open source uh, library, which is called MLflow, which is very known also in the machine learning community. And we plug in into the, in the platform. Uh, then uh, we, know, we need also to, 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 to have some persistence, so some, store some metadata. So basically not the data set itself, which they stay on the hospitals, but we need to, to store uh, like the, the metadata. So the data that describes the data set, or we need to store uh, how a task, a training task is uh, configured. So for this, we we also, we, we needed the database, uh, we chose uh, PostgreSQL. And then, uh, then there is a, 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 a something difficult, which is try to install something that is working in, in your environment, which is control, install the same uh, uh, modules in some, somewhere else, you know, like in the hospital. So for this, uh, we, we we try to virtualize, so to use uh, something called container, which is a, a way that it's easy to reproduce the same uh, environment uh, in different uh, parts. So, in, in, so within the hospital without no, having too much uh, difficulties. And then the, the last aspect that I want to mention that uh, uh, we we use as a, an identity provider uh, key clock, which is an open source module uh, uh, developed mainly by Red Hat, uh, which is very um, robust and is very popular in the, within the research community. And also it's uh, Quite easy to, if in the future we want to uh, connect or federate this uh, identity provider with the lifecycle AI of the uh, European uh, Union, then uh, it's something that has been already done. So it's something that we can also provide uh, in the future. So the one is the last uh, slide. Silvia, I don't know if you want me to explain or you want to explain. 
I can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Thank you. So on this uh, diagram, diagram, we try to put all the module that uh, I explained before. So you, you see, you see, Docker is the virtualizer. Then you see the central box, which is the red orange, is uh, uh, describing how the uh, the training uh, the, the training is done, no? the model training. So you see the, the communication is uh, via gRPC, and then you see that uh, there are the in the big central green box there are the fast API which connects to the yellow box, which are the, the hospital, no? they, they also have the fast API server. And then you can see that uh, the, the big difference between the, you know, the hospital box and the central box is that uh, in the hospital, yeah, there, there is also the, the ingestion pipeline, so the data provisioning. So basically all the structure, all the infrastructure that you need no, to, to provide, to generate this uh, data set that then will be used uh, for the for the AI training. Uh, so, and then you can see that the module like MLflow or the PostgreSQL are only on the central server because the the the, the model lifecycle is managed at the central place in this case. And then, you know, uh, you you can see that when there is a Mentioned to Kong, which is a, a, a proxy server in front of the of the infrastructure, which uh, uh, make it easy to to secure the communication between the different uh, actors of the infrastructure. So that thing that's all for this part. And I I start also this uh, the, the third uh, section, which is uh, which describes how we use the platform or how the platform is intended to be used. So maybe uh, from the what we have explained before, basically the, there are two uh, big parts that uh, uh, together they they are the platform. So there are the machine learning or federated learning platform, and then there are the data provisioning part. They they need to be connected because as uh, Van San mentioned, the data is a uh, the core part of the of the AI. So we need. To have something that provide accurate and data in the same uh, data format. So this is the, the data provisioning part. And then once this uh, data set has been generated, then we can uh, use the machine learning training platform to to train the model on this uh, uh, federated data set. So uh, the two parts uh, uh, run at different speed in the sense that. Uh, you can imagine that data provisioning needs to start from when the raw data is generated. So in the case of genomics data, when the, the sequencing has been uh, uh, generated, so from the fast queue, and, to, and then move from the fast queue to the to the var to the variance. It can take, uh, you know, depending on the infrastructure, on the size of the of, of the sample, it can take uh, hours, can take uh, some days. So. It, it, it has a, a time scale which is different from uh, what is required from the platform. So basically, uh, the way we connect these two different worlds is that uh, once uh, a data set has been uh, successfully generated and uh, inserted in the common data model, then is extracted as a, a data set, which is usually a, a CSV file. And then this file is... Uh, data set is registered into the central platform. So the central platform is now aware that there are this uh, data set with this metadata, which is uh, available for uh, for training. There are different users which uh, interact with the platform. And one is, uh, of course, the, the one of what we call data custodian or the data owner, or, is the, the 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 person that uh, uh, can sh share or share can register the data set into the platform so what what she needs to do is basically uh, get, um, understand if there is already use cases uh, defined in the within the project that uh, it can be leveraged and then it can uh, get hold of the same uh, analysis pipeline 
which needs to be the same for all the same uh, use cases. So it, it will uh, or she will run the this data set with this uh, standard pipeline, and then what the the the, the, the results of this pipeline will be uploaded into the fire server, which uh, is the common where the common data model lives, and then the, as the it, it will be extracted from the the, the fire server, generated the CSV file, and then we the the data custodian or helped by the data engineer, he could uh, register the data set in the in the in the federated learning platform. Then another use case is that another user will be of course the data scientist. So a data scientist that wants to uh, create a new model or test a new algorithm, uh, he, he or she will have to do like basically two uh, two step: one outside the platform, and one inside. So outside the platform, the data scientist it, it will need to get all of the synthetic data set or the public data set. We describe the is a representative of the use case that uh, she would like to uh, to tackle. Then he, he, she will start uh, developing locally an algorithm, a model. Once he, this model is working fine locally, he will try to federate it or, to see, or simulate the federation locally. And then before uploading this model to the uh, federated learning uh, platform, she will need to to use the validation protocol, which is uh, something that uh, the for all is uh, working on. So it's a way of uh, ensuring that the, the model is uh, uh, properly properly federated, that is going to give uh, a good result once it, it will be deployed into the central platform. So this is the still the data scientist. So once he validated the, the algorithm, the model, he can upload the model to the platform, select the, uh, and then he can uh, generate a training. Uh, to generate a training, he will need to select an algorithm, a model. From the UI, select a, a, a set of data sets, configure the parameter, then I run the training. And then he, once the training has been uh, uh, finished, then he could uh, you should check the, the result of the accuracy and validate the, the model. And then the last uh, use case is something that we haven't uh, implemented yet, but is the basically the clinician when he will be able to use the the model validated and uh, learn train on the federated data set. He could use this model to uh, predict. Uh, so based on the their input data, but this part is something that we need uh, to discuss with the. Uh, with the clinician, we did a genome for a project, and we need to see how we can uh, implement this feature out in a way that is being will be useful for, the, for them. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Davide. So, to finish with this uh, <coughs> uh, platform usage uh, part, third part of this webinar, uh, here is a, a diagram which uh, summarizes, in fact, uh, uh, into a synthetic way, in fact, the different. Um, dimensions around this platform. So we have a, a, a solution <clears throat> component dimension where we recognize the different elements. I'm going through that quickly after Davide. We have a data flow uh, dimensions that shows how the data are floating across the platform. And we have also a user dimension. So who is doing what? Uh, as Davide uh, currently explained. And this diagram uh, has the objective, in fact, to synthesize uh, all of that into a, a, a same picture. So back to, um, to what Davide is saying and uh, not uh, overlapping what you have already described, but uh, on the left-hand side, you have the different uh, contributing hospitals. So here we represent only two, but each of these hospitals have their own source of record, as you see on the left-hand side. So if I look at the the, the data flow, it's uh, going through the left to the right. So the source of record coming from the data source of the, of the hospitals. You have a first platform component, which is in charge of this data extraction that we have discussed uh, previously, and which is, uh, as I explained before, using either ETL, Radip, Surveys, or ADS. 
and you have the command data model into the hospital, the contributing hospitals, which is based on fire and which consolidate all of these data together into, into a single da data model. Then arrive here the machine learning worker, which is the federating worker that uh, uh, David has presented uh, just before. The input element of this worker are the data set which are extracted from the common data model and which are containing, I would say, the, the normalized data uh, for the trainings. When I say normalized, it means the gender is not female or male. It may be one or zero. Uh, the sex, uh, sorry, the gender, or, or we may have other attributes which are normalized into a way that it can be Tot easily understood by the algorithms when it trains the data. And the, the, the space of this worker is really focusing on three functions, as David said, qu checking the quality of the data in order to validate that the proper data, we are, the data we are pushing to this model will not introduce a BA uh, or deviations on the final training. Uh, of course, work on the training activity uh, for the for for the models, and also, as David said, validates that what is produced by this uh, contributor, a federated learning contributor, has the right uh, level of quality and uh, accomplishment. Uh, then, once uh, an hospital has trained its data, uh, it push its uh, individual models to the central server that we have discussed uh, previously. And the, uh, the central server is the second part of Davide uh, development and all, all his teams who has worked on this framework. It is the part where you orchestrate the activity of the different uh, contributors, the workers. It's the place where you uh, assemble and the, the different contributions into a single model uh, so that's where you aggregate, and that's that's the heart of the federated learning concept. So you aggregate the contribution of each of these uh, contributors, and you need to validate incrementally that this aggregation is fitting uh, quality uh, and and expected outcome. For example, do not introduce again specific BAs because you have different hospitals providing uh, their own feature, but not all the hospitals have the same amount of data. You may have a big hospitals which produce a very rich uh, individual model where you have another hospitals who are receiving less, less patients which we, we may produce another version of, of the same model trained differently. So when you aggregate all of that into your federated learning manager, you need to validate that this integration takes place correctly. And then as, as David said, there is this uh, broadcast activity to send back the new model version to the hospital clinical decision support team, such as it can be used by clinicians. That's a step where we, that we didn't reach yet because this model has to go through medical device validations as it is an AI which support the decision uh, activity of the, of the clinician. It has to go through specific criteria of validation like medical devices uh, that are currently also uh, standardized by the European Commission. So uh, we are not at this stage yet, yet but the models, uh, uh, the, the, the data flow is, is already in place. So that's for data flow uh, uh, dimensions for uh, data flow and component dimension. Now from the users, I don't repeat what David has said, but we have the clinical researcher which have the ability to extract data from the source of record and populate the data model. You have the data engineer in the middle who are taking care that the training is, is running correctly, many, uh, checking the quality of the data set, uh, executing the training and validating the model outcomes that they can push to the central system. This is a key function because uh, that decides on the quality of the final model which is aggregated. So it's a key function. And on the on the right hand side, you have data scientists, of course, which are running working on this model aggregation and checking that the quality is uh, is always uh, the one that is expected and that there's no deviation. So three main roles 
uh, of users on the platform, which is distributed, as we see here, between a central system on the right hand side and contributor workers, which are distributed across the different hospitals. So that's all. Okay, so thank you very much, Davide and Vansant. Once we have presented the main objectives and also the, the general approach of the Genome for All Federated Learning Platform, we would like to share with you some lesson learned that we have from these months of work. The first one is that one of the main lessons learned that, uh, that we have is that the gathering requirements from the different stakeholders is not a simple task. In this environment, we have uh, several different kind of stakeholders with different knowledge. So it's, in, it's very, very important to reach the gap between uh, the technical expertise that we have and the domain specific knowledge of the clinicians and so on. Our second uh, lesson learned that we like to share with you is that our experience has revealed that designing, implementing and deploying a platform like this one is very, very complex. So uh, it is um, important to have the, the necessary infrastructure in place to make the development, the integration, the testing and the deployment easier. Uh, the third one is that we have come to uh, to understand that a close collaboration with the uh, IT department of the different hospitals is crucial for the deployment of the solution. Their expertise is essential in ensuring that a, a smooth deployment of the solution. And perhaps one of the most critical lessons learned is the importance of the data provisioning, provisioning that uh, my colleagues has mentioned before. Uh, collecting the initial data set for the deployment for the development of the initial models, but also collecting the different uh, data to be included to be included in the data set in the hospitals. Is, is very is a very important task and a very, very complex one. And the transformation that uh, is needed uh, to be performed to have the all the data into the right format for for the for the AI training is vital for the success of the platform. So this is I think one of the most important lessons learned that we have from the from our experience in this in this uh, project, and uh, I think that uh, we all like to thank uh, to thanks to the to the organization and also to the to our colleagues in the in the in the project for their work. And thank you so much for your attention. And we are here. If you have any kind of questions, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation, Silvia Davide Vincent. Thank you so much. So I would like to check with my colleague Diana if um, we can display the question, if any, gathered on the on the slide. Thank you. So we go with the first one. Nice presentation. I could the same. Have you tried deploying new edge nodes in this current federation? And if so, how do you handle disparities among them on, for instance, data quality? Um, well, I can I can partially answer to that. Uh, the the project is uh, has a limited scope in terms of partners at the moment. So um, the partners which are uh, onboarded on the project are going to deploy uh, the current um, uh, workers, uh, federated workers, into their institutions. Um, when you say, have you tried deploying new edge nodes? I understand the question as 
other hospitals which are not currently uh, in this perimeter? The answer is no, because uh, the project maturity has not reached its final stage. But that is the objective, in fact, to define um, a kind of a protocol. It's not a kind of a protocol which um, allows uh, the, uh, the introductions of new partners a new H node type into the federations uh, for a given algorithm. And uh, the consortium has worked on that in order to define what are the different steps. And in this process, validation process for new nodes uh, introductions, they are uh, clear, um, uh, clear uh, well-defined space for uh, assessing the data quality uh, that is proposed uh, by this new contributor, uh, but also uh, its capability to train the models, because uh, that may, uh, depending on the, the model itself and the data, we have genomic data processing, so we may have uh, potentially um, uh, uh, potentially a problem there. And it's also its capability to extract the required data for the model from its source of information. So and so in this in this space, a, a capability to deploy a fire uh, common data model and then execute the ETL on top of this common data model. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so if Silvia or David don't want to add anything, I will go with the second question. My question as a clinician will be if this federated architecture means there be no need to anonymize the source data anymore since only the model moves. I, uh, Sylvia, I can answer uh, up to you, David or Sylvia, but... You can go if you want. Okay. Uh, yes, that's... That's the principle, in fact. In fact, uh, as the model is moving to the data, uh, you we don't have the need to uh, anonymize the, the data before training the model. Uh, but we must be conscious that this concept uh, is has some subtleties if the number of information that are are provided to the model when it is trained at the at the edge is uh, very small because then you increase the risk to re-identify potentially a patient into the model data that are being brought, brought to the central systems. But in theory, this is one of the big uh, attractions and big added value of federated architecture. Data are not moving outside of the organizations where they've been produced. So there is no need for anonymizing this data because we are not concentrating and aggregating all of this data into a central space for training the model. The only place where we need to anonymize the data and we had to do that for this project is for creating the first version of the model to create the seed that is used uh, as the initial model version, which is used by the different hospitals. Because then here you need, you need a reference data set, which is developed by the data scientist into the central place. And for that, we need, we had to ask the different uh, hospitals to contribute with anonymized data set, uh, uh, pseudonymized in this case, but uh, anonymized in the main concept in order to develop the first models. But once this first model has been developed, the, the concept proposed to not anonymize any new data when they are used for training the, the new version of the model at the edge. That's the big attractions of the fidelity learning, yes. And that's why this project has a, a, a lot of... Uh, 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 potentiality, in fact, in the future, because we are addressing a data privacy issue that is at the heart of the cybersecurity department of every hospital. Anything else to be added from the other speakers or other questions from, no, from I, the I, audience? I, I agree with Manshan that uh, maybe we should, the, the people that develop the, the model, 
should take care that the model doesn't uh, leakage any information somehow. But uh, I guess that uh, the point that uh, within uh, a control network like uh, it is this, I think there is very uh, low probability that this is going to happen. But then if you, if you have an open network, there are a lot of actors that you don't you don't you don't control them. You can add uh, like uh, uh, differential privacy. You can add uh, there are way of uh, try to to mask this uh, privacy also further. But uh, I think I think within a, a control environment, uh, I think uh, there is no need to there is no this risk. And um, also, there is a, a last uh, dimension that has not been uh, presented here and also uh, really developed with this project, and which is related to federated learning. Uh, in the new future, this technology, I'm, I'm convinced on that, will get more and more attractions uh, on the on the on the on the community uh, in the right uh, right sense uh, on the community of um, of uh, scientists and data searchers. Nevertheless, uh, when we consider rare disease, uh, th this is a concept very attracting because you have a lot of disparity in terms of data volumes across the, the hospitals. You may have a big hospitals uh, which has the capability to have perhaps 100 or 200 patients affected by the, uh, unfortunately, by this disease. And you may have five or six or 10 patients to a smaller hospitals, but that may be very valuable also to contribute to the, to the federated learning. So rare disease is, a, is very interesting, uh, is a very interesting use case for applying federated learning because it allows these different entities to work together. Nevertheless, what we, we, we see potentially arriving and it has not been addressed in this project is the rewarding in some way. Because if you have a very important hospital uh, which is contributing massively to the training of the model, it may be in a position uh, to ask for some potential reward in regards to the resulting model that has been produced. This is not the case at the moment because we are in a public community, a public hospital community mainly, uh, that are for the moment openly contributing uh, to, to this to this um, to this uh, objective of training model but if we apply the concept to a wider community including private actors and so on we may we will have the questions of uh, rewarding depending on the contribution that each organization is producing for training the model which is a very interesting concept to, to be consolidated. There are already papers, research papers, which are looking at that. We have not addressed it, but that's a vision. And that's a, a challenge that we see ahead to be to be addressed certainly at the time. Thank you very much. I think all the questions have been tackled. So, so thank you very much to the three speakers for having shared their knowledge and expertise and time with us today and also to the audience and my colleague of Australo team also for the for the support thank you very much